Hey, you are listening and watching to the Heidi Ruscio podcast. It's a place where you're going to hear from female leaders, creators, and innovators. I'm Heidi. And if you're wondering, what is this all about? If you, this is your first time listening. Well, I was an on-air radio talent for years, and now I am full-time doing voiceover as well as acting, and my husband and I are small business owners. We own Atlanta Voiceover Studio Training and Recording Facility. So the reason why I started the podcast is because, first of all, I like a lot of different things. I like interior design and food and fitness and health and business and inspiration and and I le- love learning about all of those things. And so I thought, hey, maybe you like that as well. So I decided to start interviewing other female leaders and creators and innovators in all those areas so that we could learn together and feel supported and not alone, especially with the business stuff. Man, you can feel really alone in that. Well, today's guest is Oh, she's wonderful. Her name is Ellie Winters, and her and her twin sister, Linda, were the double mint twins. If you remember those commercials, the double mint gum commercials with the twins, um, they, their commercials were the longest running in the double mint history (laughs) from 1985 to 1995. In fact, after she left, my husband was like, oh yeah, definitely had a crush on them for sure. (laughs) So, um, she's going to, LA is going to tell us the story of how they even became the Double Mint Twins. Um, how that all worked out was really, really fascinating. They actually weren't intending to to act, um, but it's a really cool story. And then she tells another story that's a little bit more sad, and it deals with her and her sister, Linda, kind of having a falling out of some sorts, definitely some separation and tension in that relationship, and what they did to heal and what they did to get over it. In fact, They talk a little bit more about that story in a segment that Oprah did called Oprah's Where Are They Now? And I linked that um, that video in the show notes. So if you want to go hear more about the story, you can just click and look down at the show notes. We talk about comparison because, of course, as a twin, everybody's comparing you, right? And so I think some of those principles that we talk about are really going to help and encourage you if you've ever compared yourself. I'm sure you haven't because... You know, you're probably amazing, awesome, and healthy all the time. (laughs) So, but I know I sure have. And I learned a lot from LA, and I think you will too. Her story's cool. I I I really think you're gonna laugh, you're gonna learn a lot. I think you're gonna enjoy this episode. So let's talk to LA. Okay, so um Lisa, now I said LA Winters in the introduction, but um that was because in this world of social media and yes. website and stuff. There were a lot of leases out there. And so you just made it a little bit simpler with LA Winter. So if I call Lisa, Lisa, just know I am talking to the same person that I mentioned in the intro. <laughs> yes, those are my initials. Stands for Lisa Ann. I love it. So. Oh, it's such a great Southern name to Lisa Ann. Exactly. Yes, it's <laughs> I perfect. I wish I had gone with that. <laughs> so Lisa, talk to me about the days before the Double Mint Twins commercial. So were you in acting or were you pursuing that at that time? Well, it, uh, the brief history is that Linda and I, my identical twin, started as dancers. We were doing community theater, fell in love with dance, started studying it seriously. We were taking the train downtown to Chicago. We lived both lived in Chicago at the time after school and high school, a number of days a week, and um, became very serious dancers. Met um, some models while we were dancing. In fact, one of our teachers in the suburbs was doing some choreographed runway shows and asked wow. us to do that. So we were modeling then um, while we were dancing. Okay. And that was around age 16, 17. And okay. then we danced professionally at the at uh, Great America Six Flags for a summer. Oh, my so gosh. So we were so passionate about dancing. <laughs> it was fun. Um, and then by happenstance, some of the regular models said, you should consider this. We had never considered it. So long story short, we went downtown Chicago, saw some agents. And one of the agents said, I think you can model but you should do it separately, not as twins. There aren't any jobs for twins. Mm. And we had never considered that. Our maiden name was Yoko Venus. 
So ah, that's it. where the first name change came. Okay. She went with Ryan. I went with Winters, Winters. Linda Ryan, Lisa Winters. Went with separate agencies. Started separate modeling careers around our senior year in high school. And then started doing some commercial auditions through the agencies as well. Mm-hmm. And inevitably, we would end up, our hair was different. We cut our hair differently um, and used different last names, different agents. Inevitably, many times it would come down to the two of us um, or, or casting directors would be seeing us for a commercial, and at the end of the day, it'd be like everyone started to look alike because we didn't tell people that we were identical right. twins in the same industry in the same city. Oh so my gosh, we that's were competing crazy. against each other. Yeah, and um, it was it was fairly even. We would both book jobs. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, um, so then I moved uh, to Atlanta. During that time, I happened to get an audition for Flashdance. For the lead wow. in Flashdance, because I was a dancer. Mm-hmm. And I made it through um, to some of the people they were considering through the dance audition. Mm-hmm. Got my first set of copy as an actress with a casting director. And wow. this is why I started acting, mm-hmm. because I, I it was my first audition. And when I kind of ended the audition, I looked at the casting director. She had tears in her eyes. And I was like, I have to do this. I mm-hmm. The idea that I had moved someone with story resonated so deeply within me that I literally that week went and started studying at Victory Gardens Theater, continued to study, um, when we moved down to Atlanta Alliance Theater, studied, had an opportunity to go to New York, studied. So mm-hmm. all of that was happening. I was had a passion for and was developing my craft yeah. during that time. Yeah. Meanwhile, Linda and I had were now separate in two different industries. So I was modeling down here in Atlanta. She was modeling in Chicago. We missed each other. Her husband, being a top fashion photographer in Chicago, did headshots. And she said, why don't we cut our hair alike now that we're in separate cities and do some headshots and see if we might get some work together? Oh, that's it, so fun. It was, yeah. well, it was amazing timing. It sure. was really a divine set of circumstances mm-hmm. because what we didn't know is that Double Mint had just started a nationwide tour for new twins. So we didn't even have the, uh, at that time it was like proofs. Mm -hmm. Then you had to get them blown up. Yeah. (laughs) Um, We didn't even have any headshots blown up. So she took the the contact sheets basically with her to the audition and went by herself. I couldn't afford to fly up there just for an audition. Yeah. So she went, did well enough that they narrowed it down to nine sets of twins and flew me up for the callbacks. Wow. So they were doing a nationwide search. And um, we... Just had come to a place where we just said, you know, God, if you can use this for anything, go, you know, we would love to be together, but whatever. Yeah. Went in, did our best. Didn't hear anything for over a month. And on a commercial audition like that, you know. Sure. You're like, there's no way. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Got the phone call. Her agent called her. And again, long story short, they booked us for the first commercial. We ended up doing six commercials over a three year period. And the, the one that people recognize the most, the pool spot mm. where the hats blow off, played for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. So it enabled us, when we would go shoot these commercials at great locations, to have time together as sisters mm. as well. And um, it, it was a very, very special time. Mm. And also afforded uh, my acting career in New York. I was commuting for two and a half years. So wow. um, it, there were a lot of amazing things that came out yeah. of Yeah. Double Did mint. that a lot of times in the acting community when somebody books something that then you're recognized mm-hmm. uh, nationally, people automatically think, "Oh, that." I mean, after that, it's like things just <laughs> must uh, the floodgates must open for up sure. for you, <laughs> and you know that is the start of a beautiful career. Yeah. What did happen in reality from that? Well. It's interesting because a lot of potential opportunities get, did come. We had incredible exposure at the time. I was literally being recognized by myself in Atlanta mm-hmm. during those days. Um, so there, 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 there were. There's a saying in the industry that work begets work, and it's true. But it doesn't always mean that it's the same kind of work or that it's on a higher level. So you know, twin things are pretty rare. Mm. So it wasn't like there was an immediate opportunity for us to go on and do more. We did do some work for um, the American Cancer Society on their Celebrities Against Cancer Board. We traveled and we Mm. 
got to speak. And, and that was an amazing opportunity that came directly out of Double Mint. Mm-hmm. It did help um, us individually, the exposure with more commercial work, but it did not translate in, into acting mm. because it's it was commercial. And at the same time, thing. I was trying to develop you know my serious acting mm-hmm. career. So there was a little bit of a push and pull there yeah. as, as just myself instead of the twins. Yeah, yeah. Did that... Did that cause any frustration for you in your act? I mean, because that's really what you you wanted to tell stories, which commercials do in some way, but it's kind of a a, a different way. It for is. Sure. It's, it's a whole different way. I can't say that it caused conflict because at the time, um, I it, 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 it the the money coming in from the commercials mm-hmm. and the exposure. Uh, I was doing a play down here in Atlanta, but more at a community theater level, Barefoot yeah. in the Park. And some the lead in New York, who was friends of the director here, was was doing a production of it off off Broadway at the ATA Theater. Their lead got sick. I had just done it, done done it, and I they flew me up there for it. Wow! As a result, because I had some recognition, and I was doing this little tiny you know theater, some New York agents came, and that oh. interest they they wanted me to up there and I did I commuted for two and a half years early in my marriage wow. studied acting auditioned book, booked a few things um commercially industrially and was starting to to book with uh William Morris theatrically when a tension developed within me hmm. that I didn't want to raise kids in Manhattan hmm. and it was being becoming very consuming, and it was stressing my marriage, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, my husband is amazing, but I, for two and a half years I was commuting, mainly yeah, living in tough. Manhattan. So I left the industry um, after a lot of prayer and consideration right when things were starting to happen. Mm-hmm. But I don't have any regrets because yeah. I don't think I would still be married or have kids, <laughs> right. to tell you the truth. Sure, sure. For me, I, I really couldn't do it all. Yeah. So anyway, that is the, the, uh, the uh, shorter version of how I ended – in what I call my, up in my nesting years. So I kind of mm-hmm. left the business commercially yeah. acting for over 17 years mm-hmm. and raised my kids. Yeah, that's great though. So, uh, that's oh, awesome. No regrets. It's, it's the reason I'm doing what I am now. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about sisters because yes. um, I have a sister. We're 19 months apart. So not twins, but pretty, cl- I mean, yeah. very close. Okay. And very it, similar dynamics. Yes. And we're the first two of the family. There's four of us. And I remember growing up that, you know, people would always say, and this led me to counseling, uh, you know, for years, but people would always say, oh, Meg, she's the pretty one, you know. Wow. And we just were constantly being compared. I have naturally curly hair. She has completely straight hair. We just are totally two different people. She looks like my mom. I look like my dad. You know, very different. And that has always been a hard thing for me to even get over yeah. for years of that comparison. I can only imagine that it's a hundred times more with a twin in the same industry <laughs> and an industry that focuses on looks. Yes. <laughs> How did that impact your relationship with Linda? Um, it did a lot. Thank you for being so vulnerable mm-hmm. about that and just saying that, you know, you went to counseling and it, it does. I mean, there's no way around it. We live in a culture where um, beauty is a commodity, mm-hmm. you know, and it gives you power that you didn't ask for, and it and it can give you also a, 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 again a sense of identity and value that on things it should not be based on. Mm-hmm. So, and then being like you said in an industry that directly um, correlates with that was hard because we separated our careers, mm-hmm. so we were um, yes being com- compared a lot. It, it you know it impacted both of us individually and in some of the same ways and in different ways. So this, the same thing was that people, especially with identical twins, and I don't, and I'm thinking, I don't know if it was actually worse for you because you were <laughs> so different right? or us, I don't know, but it, it's not good either way when comparison enters in. Sure. People have a natural desire, especially with identical twins, to find the difference because it's a little ungrounding to look at two people who genetically are the right. same. And it's like, what makes you different? And how can I know who you are? So first of all, I was dealing with a sense of, am I even special because there's two of me? Mm. And I, did, I wasn't able to articulate that early. Thankfully, I was. Mm. So... Just on that level, let me say that coming into a faith, I realized that um, these outer bodies are temporary and they are vessels. 
but they hold what I believe is to be a uniquely created, God-given individual spirit Mm -hmm. and identity. So I feel like identical twins are kind of that object lesson. Mm -hmm. On the same DNA-wise, we are exactly the same. We are one, one embryo that's split. So I realized that my spirit is who I am, mm-hmm. and I, it is uniquely created, and I, it is different from my sister. So some of our purposes will intersect in life, and some of them will not. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's a dance. So on the exterior, though, even being identical, we are different. You know, um, I, it may sound strange, I tend to favor, as they say in the South, <laughs> <laughs> my father. Mm-hmm. You know, the differences lean towards his DNA, um, and differences in Linda's appearance um, lean a little bit towards my mom. So the shape of our eyes, the shape of our face. But when someone would try to point out the differences, they would say, oh, you know, your face is more rounder. And so then that's internalized by the twin that that was said to, oh, I'm fat. Yes. I'm fatter. Um, or this is more that or that. And they're only looking for differences. Although I will say some people don't even think twice, as I'm sure you realize, mm-hmm. about saying, oh, you're the pretty one. Yep. Yeah, and and they'll identify things like that, or you're the thinner one, or you're the this or that, you know, mm-hmm. and then your identity starts to be built on a negative idea. You know, mm-hmm. we tend to do that; we internalize the negative because you know, growing up, it, there's so much insecurity around um, if we measure up mm-hmm. in our in our in our beauty and our looks and all that. So yes, it, it played a part. Um, it didn't really manifest as you would think during the modeling days. Mm-hmm. I think we were both just so excited about our lives and what we were doing and all that. But it did, ma- and thankfully, we never um, wanted to date the same person or, yeah. oh my goodness, <laughs> I can't even imagine what that <laughs> would have been like. I know. I think oh. that anybody that's not a twin immediately thinks about that and how fun that would be to switch <laughs> it up or to yes. jo- like to joke with someone. And, but you guys never did that. Well, we didn't for okay. two, two reasons. Well, we tried in kindergarten. <laughs> And that kind of put a, the gabosh on the whole uh, thing because we're mirror twins. I'm left-handed and she's right-handed. Oh. So uh, that's a whole other thing. But we're, we were learning to write. And so our, our, our kindergarten teacher, Miss Precise, could tell we switched seats who was who because of left-handedness. And we uh, didn't too young to think about that. Right. So we were kind of embarrassed because she made a big deal about it. <laughs> and we were kind of shy, even though we were in industry growing up. Accidentally, though, once... Um, each of us had an accident with our boyfriends. <laughs> I'll just I'll just say real quick. Yeah. I was dating the same guy in high school for like, you know, my, my senior year through the two years after that or whatever. For So for three years. And uh, so he had come back from college and we were going to go um, out with a friend of his he had brought. So the four of us would go, Linda and I mm-hmm. and Chaz, who I've been dating for quite some time. And uh, he brought a friend and uh, and he was walking to the door and we were going somewhere fancy. I, I, she had on the prom dress that I wore with him, senior prom. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, um, I, I'm coming down the stairs behind her. She opens the door. He leans in to give her a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just as he's leaning in, I'm on the stairs. I'm like, Chaz, it's like two years <laughs> in the relationship. And he looks up and just went pale, you know, because oh he had gosh. never, he ever so confused sure. us before. Yeah. And the only thing that is still extremely identical about us is our voices. So mm-hmm. so our husbands who have never had a hard time visually mm-hmm. telling the difference do have a hard time sometimes on the phone. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. So there was something that happened, though, in you and Linda's relationship kind of after yeah. the industry. What what happened? You know, it, it's, um, I'll just tell you, I feel a little trepidatious about speaking for her, sure. but she did speak so openly on the, mm-hmm. would you listen to the uh, Oprah's Where Are They They Now? As well, the first time she really opened up about it. Mm-hmm. And that was only t- a year and a half, two years ago. Mm-hmm. There was a long period of time <clears throat> where she just went through a um, form of insecurity that caused like a jealousy Mm -hmm. and she had a hard time i'm sorry i get emotional um connecting with me and being around me and for it caused a great deal of pain and distance she hated it Mm -hmm. she couldn't control it yeah at the same time she was dealing with some anxiety 
I mean, like extreme debilitating mm-hmm. anxiety. And, um, and so I, 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 that's actually what brought us kind of back together when it, when her anxiety became so difficult, she had moved, um, to Atlanta from Chicago. We had been apart for a long time and I was able to, um, connect with her that way, just be there for her. Mm. And it helped her to kind of retrospectively look at how much separation she had allowed to happen. Part of it was because I was, I, at that time I had re-entered the industry and I was Mm -hmm. following that passion. Um, she had, she had produced, a, 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 a. uh, album she had done some things on her own that were amazing but she hadn't really stayed in the industry so I think that was we had always kind of even though we were doing it separately we all also did it together Doublement brought us together and so I think it brought about mm. just a lot of feelings that she wasn't ready for mm. um, insecurities um, and and if you've if you know someone or if you've ever been through any kind of uh, clinical anxiety or depression, it can rock your identity. And she has become very vulnerable about saying how it made her feel weak. And she's an amazing, I mean, mm. I've watched her fight through it and she's fine um, now. But it, 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 it made her feel so mm. weak that it was, it was hard. That also made it hard for her to be, she needed me. Sure. But at the same time, she didn't want to need me. Yes, yes. And um, so it was through um, a lot of prayer, a lot of um, unconditional love that she had for me and I had for her. And we would have very difficult conversations mm-hmm. when we would identify what each, uh, what, what, you know, the anger. It brought up a lot of anger in me because, mm-hmm. you know, when you're the person on that end, you really didn't do anything. right. Um, the kind of injustice of it yeah. can get in the way, and it hardened me. Sure. So it made it hard for forgiveness to happen because every time I felt like we were reaching somewhere and if it kind of reared its ugly head again, uh, I I felt snake bit. I felt mm-hmm. like, you know, there was nothing I could do to control it. We had to talk through all of that, mm. and and that's not easy. That's not easy, yeah. No. Mm. Um, but thankfully, we both, I mean, the love, the foundation of unconditional love, um, the faith to know that, you know, in and of ourselves, we're not enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that God is strong where we're weak and that's a beautiful thing. And when we can allow that to happen, then real healing can happen in a relationship, but also individually, we both had to allow sure. that healing yeah. to happen. So it's, it's not an easy thing. Mm-hmm. How did you, i I know you're interviewing me, but <laughs> <laughs> I am curious. This is turning the tables. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious that because you, you, that's what you connected with yeah. and you had a similar experience. How did, how did, did you exp- mm. have the same thing where you just had to talk through it? And I, I did. And I, thankfully there wasn't any like major, um, period of time where my sister and I, you know, weren't talking to each other or anything like that. But I, there were, there were moments I probably identified a little bit more with Linda, Mm -hmm. you know, if I'm being totally honest and vulnerable of feeling this frustration of like, I'll never be pretty enough, you know, for that attention or skinny enough to, it was a a matter of, yeah, weight. (laughs) Um, It was through a lot of counseling. Mm -hmm. And, but like you said, I think that what's so important is, is that individual work. Yes. And on both sides. And um, I had to do that work to heal inside. There was nothing that my sister Meg could ever say to me. You know, she loves me so much, and that is so important. Yes. But there's nothing that she could say to me to just make it all better. It, it had to come from within. I had to believe that all those things that were said growing up do not put the ultimate value on me in That's my right. life and right. even going forward. Um so that was a big part of it was just that individual work. And we're so close and, um, and just have a beautiful relationship right now. But yeah, it took years and really a lot of counseling on my part and work on my Linda heart. went through, through counseling and she fought so hard and she would even identify when she didn't like the feelings and that was helpful. And I think, um, it was so 
important that neither of us, it would have been easier for either of us to kind of close the door Mm. and to say, you know what, this hurts too much. We were hurting from different spaces, but there, I was tempted to just close the door Mm -hmm. for good, you know, come to my heart and just kind of play at the relationship, play the role Mm -hmm. of the twin, you know, sister, but we loved each other too much and we couldn't stand that distance. Mm. So I, I think that's, that's, I would say keeping your heart open as hard as it is and working through the pain instead of away from it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're closer now. Yeah. And, and I, I, because when you do go through, even like in a marriage, when you go through something like that um, in any relationship, you can come out stronger mm-hmm. on the other side if you move through what's causing the, yeah. the, the distance. Yes. There's something beautiful about um, relationship resilience Mm -hmm. that allows you to love even bigger after you go through that. And not just your sibling or your spouse, but anybody that you come in contact with. And it's a great way of putting it. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. So one of the things that, and I'm going to be vulnerable again and share kind of my story on this, but one of the things that I found that I struggled with because of that relationship with my sister and being compared growing up was that other females that I would see, not just my sister, that I feel like, oh my gosh, they're way prettier or they're so much more accomplished. I automatically felt a little threatened, not Mm -hmm. threatened, maybe threatens not the word, but that comparison of like, oh, well then she probably is way more valuable than I am because of X, Y, Z. Um, did you, do you feel like that, that, is that true among oh, sisters? And it's then, not just true among sisters. I yes. felt like a total imposter coming here today. Yeah. I mean, mm. it's like, you know, that comparison of like seeing other people who are like really doing things, mm-hmm. you know, who really running a company or really, you know, acting more, whatever. Yeah. It makes me feel silly. Mm. Like I'm just kind of pie in the sky, you know, it's, so there's always that. And, 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 and I, love encouraging i'm a natural mentor i'm a natural encourager but at the same time it it can feel i, I feel so vulnerable at times like mm-hmm. you know i have no business being here or doing that because mm-hmm. look at so and so is really doing it mm-hmm. you know and so yeah. comparison continually <laughs> plays a role and so it's it's all it, so what i have to do is go okay no i'm just following what i feel called to do and what i'm passionate about and if i let go or hold loosely to where it's going to go instead of having these arbitrary that aren't real, um, what the world would say Mm -hmm. or what society, I should say, says is success. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can let go of that and hold loosely to that, then I'm fine. Then I stop the comparison. But it gets in there. Yes. It always does. Yeah. I've started to, as soon as those, because they they creep in less and less Mm -hmm. as I heal more inside. Um. But when I do feel like those things are kind of creeping up, the first thing I start doing is just going, okay, Heidi, what gifts do you have? Like start focusing on those things instead of thinking what they have that you don't have. Yeah, affirming what you know to be true. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, you, you're you're a mom, you have kids, you have these whole experiences that I will never have. You know, there's this deeper... um, emotional feeling and understanding of life that I don't have and what a beautiful thing that is for you to contribute to your storytelling you know it's it it, but we can do that all day long and of course we can look at everybody else and go yeah but look at you look what you have (laughs) look what you the gifts that you're giving to the world and yet we neglect to be reminded and grateful for what we have as well and I think you know, it's interesting. I'm thinking everything we're talking about kind of um, reflects back to when I tell stories, whatever, whether I'm acting. Um, I, one of the hashtags, if you will, for social media that I use is I'm every woman. And that's not like an arrogant, like, I'm every woman. I do all these things. It comes from an idea as a storyteller, whether I'm writing or whether I'm acting or just in life. I believe as humans, not just women, regardless of the time period we were born into, the socioeconomic standing, um, gender, anything, as humans, we all have the same echoes of the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, a need for purpose, a need to be loved, 
a need to feel significance. And, you know, there this is about five echoes of the, of the heart that I think are built into our humanity. And we all have capability and struggle with the darker sides of our humanity. And we experience the lighter sides all to different degrees, but it's always there. And those, those, Factors are always at work. And so when I play a woman that is not like me, or I meet a woman that's not like me, I know that there's something that I can connect to and understand. And it's not greater or less than. It's not an evaluation thing. It's a point of connection. Mm. You know, I know that she feels the same kind of fears and needs that I have felt to some degree, and that she's had some experiences that are hard and some that are, you know, so there's always a point of connection. It doesn't have to be a comparison. Mm-hmm. It can be a, we're, we're both human. We're in this mm-hmm. together. And I don't know everything she's faced or struggles with. And she doesn't know what I face or struggle with. But I can guarantee you that we both struggle with some of the same things yeah, or have in our life. And that's where we can mm-hmm. connect. I love that perspective, Lisa. Connection, not comparison. I love that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what you are doing now because you do there's you said kind of I call them buckets yes you know and I think everybody calls them different things I think you're saying plates that you're holding up in the the air um because you do personal training and yoga Uh right Mm -hmm. and then acting Mm -hmm. of course and then you also created a thousand word pictures and have produced a lot of content written content and then right now you're working on producing your first full-length feature, correct? Well, I say that tentatively. Let me okay. just preface it with saying getting a film made, I'm learning, oh. is like winning the lottery. Yeah. The odds are against it. So I feel very pie in the sky. Sure. But the reason I started A Thousand Word Pictures is because, for one, I, I realized I love acting, and I also love telling a story through pictures. Because visually, we can say so much with so little. Mm-hmm what a character is wearing, the angle of the shot, how it tracks, what's in the picture, what's out of frame. All of that in a glance can say so much. It's so layered like life is. Mm -hmm. So I was drawn to how can I learn to tell stories from writing and producing and uh, had a story that I wrote with some encouragement from a mentor. I've loved getting to know the film and uh, filmmaking and acting community here in Atlanta. It's rich, it's deep, it's wonderful. Yeah. And there's so many opportunities to learn. So I started volunteering behind the camera, lots of different things. Anyway, so I wrote this script called Beautiful Goodbye. And I realized I really want to maintain creative control over this. Because it's not a, it's, you can't categorize it as a faith-based story. And you can't, it can't be categorized because I believe it's, um, raw Mm -hmm. and real and I want to present characters that are complicated and layered situations that are layered but there's always hope Mm -hmm. so I was I'm I'm frankly afraid to put it into somebody else's hands and just like sell the script or whatever so I thought you know maybe I'll get to produce this and so I started a production company uh produced and and wrote and did a short film to kind of get get to learn all that called parked and um (laughs) but anyway so we'll see i'm it's in development let's say that i'm producing it it's in development and i'm getting the script out there um and i'm putting a package together and the next thing will be really how to find investors Mm -hmm. and um that's a whole thing and distribution and all that but i'm i i i always say my passion takes me past my fear Mm -hmm. So I, it becomes more uncomfortable for me to not do something <laughs> yeah. than to go ahead and do it as crazy as it sounds. I'm going to make yes. a film. Um, why not try? What have I got to lose? Right. Kind of one of my mantras has been, what do I have to lose but fear and pride? Mm-hmm. Because, yeah, it might be embarrassing if I fail. Sure. Um, but... Fear and pride are great things to lose. Yeah, yeah. You know? Get rid of those yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because because uh-huh. because I'll never know if I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. am <laughs> trying. <laughs> and crazy as it sounds, makes the best kind of stories, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <that's> true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My life is full of them. <laughs> Love that, Lisa. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and I know I will be cheering you on um, going forward with. Um, movie and so much more and thank you so much for sharing and being so open too I really appreciate it 
Thank you for making it easy, and I really enjoyed getting to know you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for watching this episode of the Heidi Russo podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you can catch the next one and make sure you hit that bell. And if you'd like to listen via the podcast platforms, you can find those below. We would love to hear from you. Join in on the conversation on Instagram or Facebook. And I hope this episode encouraged you. Don't stop. Get it, get it.